Welcome, everybody. Let's spend a few minutes today talking about purchasing standards. Now, as the name implies, these are the standards and procedures federal grantees must follow when purchasing goods, property, and services using grant funds. The following does not apply to states. They use their own procurement rules that apply to their non-federal purchases. Other non-federal entities like cities, counties, school districts, and nonprofits should follow their existing written procurement procedures, so long as they conform to state and local laws and to applicable federal grant regulations. And that's where you might need to make a few tweaks to your policies and procedures. When there's a conflict between an organization's procedures and federal regulations, the organization must follow federal law and use the grant management regulations in the uniform guidance. Now, the rule of thumb is a grantee's policies and procedures can be more restrictive than federal regs, but not less restrictive. Of course, when there's a question or an, an issue that absolutely, absolutely stumps you, go ahead and contact your federal program officer or your legal counsel. Or you can contact me. Uh, I'm neither a program officer nor an attorney, but I have a fair amount of experience, and I'm sure we can figure out something, you know, in 20 to 30 minutes without too much problem. All right, let's get started. <clears throat> Here are some of the general standards for procurement uh, right off the bat. Kind of common sense here. You need to maintain proper oversight of your contractors to make sure that they are living up to their obligations. The regulations don't specify how to do this. That's up to you. At the very least, your procedure should be in writing and it should assign some oversight responsibilities to a person by title, not by name, uh, who will oversee each contract and maintain all the records. Next, you'll, you need to have written standards of conduct for anyone involved with your purchasing process, including prohibiting anyone with a real or even an, an apparent conflict of interest from participating in the selection, award, or administration of a contract funded by a federal grant. Also, nonprofits, and this is something new in the uniform guidance came out a few years ago, uh, nonprofits, uh, institutions of higher education, and hospitals now need to have, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, written organizational standards of conduct if they have a parent, affiliate, or subsidiary organization. Now, an organizational conflict would occur when because of a relationship with a parent organization or a subsidiary or an affiliate, uh, the grantee is unable or appears to be unable to be impartial in conducting a procurement uh, involving a related organization. The next one, uh, again, seems like common sense, but in your policies and procedures, uh, you have to avoid the purchase of unnecessary or duplicative uh, items. When possible, if you are considering purchasing like a large piece of equipment or a vehicle or anything, anything that's going to be, you know, fairly expensive, uh, you'll want to do a lease versus purchase cost comparison to see which one is the better deal. And uh, grantees are encouraged to enter into state or local intergovernmental agreements for procurement and use of shared goods or services. I've never seen that done before, but it's, um, it's an option uh, if you're willing to explore it. Again, more common sense coming at you. Only enter into agreements with responsible contractors who can reliably fulfill a contract. 
maintain records. Yes, you need to keep records documenting each procurement history. Uh, you'll want a record of why you chose the procurement method you used, how and why you selected or even rejected a contractor, how you decided on the final price, uh, the approved contract, uh, performance reports, invoices, and anything else that helps document and explain your purchase. And this is critical because the funding agency or pass-through entity, if you're a subgrantee, at any time can ask to review your procurement procedures, uh, copies of your RFPs, bids you've received, cost estimates, contracts, the works. So you want to make sure all your records are always in order. Time and materials contracts are allowed as long as it's been determined that no other type of contract is suitable and you need to include a, um, a not to exceed price in the contract uh, if you go this route. Uh, that is, the contractor is liable for any costs above that not to exceed amount. Uh, and also, you're, you're required to, quote unquote, assert a high degree of oversight during this type of contractual arrangement. There's no definition for high degree of oversight. That's going to be up to you, but it should be obviously rigorous enough to make sure, like um, we may mentioned a couple of points ago, uh, that you only only hire contractors that are responsible and can fill, can fulfill the contract and maintain oversight of your contractors, contractors to make sure they get their job done. Dispute resolution. Now, you as the grantee are responsible for settling all contractual and administrative issues arising from procurements, resolving protests, disputes, claims, whatever. Uh, the awarding agency will not get involved unless the matter is primarily a federal concern, and that's going to be very rare. I'm not going to go through every single one of these bullet points here, but just bear in mind that all purchases must be conducted in a way that allows full and open competition while also preventing barriers and restrictions to competition. Uh, the, the regulations give a few examples uh, of situations that would restrict competition. So just for example... Uh, placing unreasonable requirements on firms in order for them to qualify to do business and uh, specifying a brand name and not allowing, <clears throat> excuse me, not allowing the bidder to offer, you know, an equal or equivalent product in their, um, in their bid. Uh, no geographic preferences either. Uh, the only time you can include geographic preferences uh, in your purchasing you know, competition um, is when federal statute specifically mandates or encourages geographic preferences. Now, the methods of procurement, uh, again, assuming that you already have written policies and procedures for purchasing or procurement, you probably have, you know, uh, methods of procurement already identified. They may not be called by these titles, uh, but I'm sure you already have something like this in your procurement manual. These are the types of procurement methods uh, the feds expect you to use. So whether or not you want to retitle it, you know, yours or just, you know, parenthetically note it in your policies and procedures or just leave it as is. I mean, it's, it's kind of up to you. Um, but here are the, the procurement methods the feds want grantees to use. So first, micro purchases allow your organization to buy goods and services valued up to $3,000 without having to request price quotes 
or to do a lot of comparison shopping. Uh, you know, obviously you want to get the best deal available, but when it comes to buying, you know, the smallest purchases, you're now free to head to Office Depot or Staples or Best Buy or wherever to make your purchases, you know, as long as you consider the price to be uh, reasonable. Before, before people had to, uh, you know, even for really just uh, minor ticky tech items, you had to, you know, call around or go online and, you know, document that you found the best price. So this, um, this is actually a real improvement over the old regs. The small purchases, uh, as the name implies, uh, small purchases are relatively small, routine purchases of goods, services, supplies, or other property that don't exceed the federal simple acquisition threshold threshold currently set at $150,000. Uh, you need to get some price or rate quotations from an adequate number of qualified vendors uh, before, you know, pulling the trigger and making a purchase. Now, adequate number is open to interpretation. Uh, you can set that number in your policies and procedures manual. The uniform guidance doesn't specify or mandate the number of price quotes, but a couple of places mention uh, two or more or uh, more than one. So you know, take that for what it's worth. I mean, you're pretty much looking at at least two. Um, of course, I mean, it all depends on uh, depends on the product or service you're uh, you're trying to get a quote from. If it's something that's fairly common, you know, maybe you want to get four or five quotations. If it's a a really specialized service or product, uh, you might be limited to two. So, uh, in your pro your procedures manual, maybe you just want to say, you know, uh, obtain you know a minimum of uh, of two quotes or not fewer than something like that. Oh, and I should mention um, the hundred and fifty thousand dollar threshold is set in the uh, federal acquisition regulations. If your organization has a lower amount for what you consider small purchases, and then use your amount. Uh, like I mentioned before, the general rule is you can make your standards more restrictive than federal regs. You just can't make them, you can't make them less restrictive. Sealed bids is the preferred method for construction projects. Uh, the only selection criteria with sealed bids is the bid amount. The contract must be awarded to the lowest bid, assuming that they, you know, conform to all the terms and condition, uh, terms and conditions. But you just, you don't have a whole lot of flexibility with, with sealed bids, just because price is the bottom line. Competitive proposals are used when making a purchase greater than the simplified acquisition threshold of 150,000 or whatever number you've established if it's less than 150 grand. Uh, the key with this method is you need a good consistent system to manage the process, uh, like a way to publicize the RFP, a written method for conducting the evaluation of proposals, and selecting the winner, uh, stuff like that. You want to be consistent each time you put out uh, an item or a service uh, for bid. You, you want that process to be consistent every time, and you want to make sure you, you follow it uh, to the letter every time. And finally, non-competitive proposals, also known as no bid or sole source. Uh, this isn't used too often, but it is an option on occasion. Uh, if you decide to go this route, you need a solid, well-documented reason why it's necessary. Uh, the feds list a few criteria you, you need to meet before you can use it, uh, like 
there's only one company that provides uh, the product or service you need, or there's an emergency and a competitive RFP, RFP process would, would cause a long delay. Um, I mean, those are, those are two, two examples. Another, another way to use sole source is just to ask permission of the awarding agency. Um, you know, their first inclination will be to say no, <laughs> because uh, so, uh, sole sourcing is kind of contrary to the whole free and open competition thing, but they might go for it if you make a decent case. And if you really think that you just can't, uh, you just can't find another vendor to do whatever it is that you need. When you go out um, for purchasing or uh, when making any procurement actions, you need to take all necessary affirmative steps to assure that small, minority-owned, and women-owned businesses are used whenever possible. And the affirmative uh, steps must include, and I've listed them here, uh, these are all from the, the federal regs. I'm not going to read them all. I'll just, I'll pause for a moment while, um, while you read them, and then we will move on. All right, we're going to go to the next slide. Here we go. And as I say that, I realize now that you're watching this on YouTube, and if you wanted, you could pause and go back. So my, my using, including this dramatic pause to allow you to read, was almost pointless. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> All right, moving along. Like I mentioned earlier, the simplified acquisition threshold is set in the federal acquisition regulations, currently 150,000. Now, remember, uh, this is connected to the competitive proposals procurement method that also has a $150,000 threshold. If you have a lower threshold for competitive proposals, use your number. And so, you know, anytime you are, you're going to, you know, make a purchase above that act, that simplified acquisition threshold of 150,000 or whatever your number is, you have to do a cost and price analysis. And the next, the second bullet point where you have to make independent estimates before receiving bids or proposals. So before you put out your RFP, uh, soliciting proposals from uh, from from different vendors, you know, you might want to just get, you know, two or three or four price quotes ahead of time. And it's really just so, so you know, you have a general idea of, of the costs involved if you don't already, if you don't already, already have one. I mean, most times when people put things out to bid, um, especially in a grant budget, you know, you might have a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars for whatever. So you already know you're capped at that amount. Um, and you're just wanting to get the best deal from the vendor to spend as little as possible on the service you need. Uh, but the Fed, the regs, you know, require you to get some some quotes before going through the whole RFP process. Um, profit needs to be negotiated separately for every contract where there's no price uh, no price competition and in all cases when a cost analysis is performed obviously only charge actual contract costs to the federal grant and you may not use cost plus a percentage of costs and percentage of construction costs uh, uh, for a method of contracting that is 
prohibited. Again, as I mentioned, as I mentioned several slides ago, federal agencies or the pass-through entities have a right to uh, review you know, all of your procurement records. Um, well, actually, the procurement records and actually any other records, uh, for that matter, during the grant or during the record retention period after the grants uh, end. So uh, make sure your documents are always in order and accessible should your funder come calling. You know, it, it's worth noting your funder just will not show up unannounced. Uh, unless you're secretly under investigation for something that you're doing, and you, you know you would have to be, <laughs> you'd have to be doing something criminal, uh, and and they would have to have been tipped off by someone. Uh, you know, if you're just kind of living life, implementing your grant, everything's cool. Your funder or the pass through agency, they're not just going to knock on your door. You know, you're going to get at least three to six months advance notice uh, before an on-site review or an audit. You know, it depends on how serious. If it's a full audit, you'll probably get six months notice. If you are a subgrantee working with a pass-through and, you know, you're both fairly small organizations, you know, maybe a month notice is all that's required. You know, it just, it all depends on your relationship with the funder, but you know, you're, you, no one's going to come knocking on your door and say, you know, show me your procurement files. That just, that, that doesn't happen. All this is, yeah, this is kind of a shaggy dog, shaggy dog here. All contracts using federal funds must include provisions addressing all of the following. Uh, you can find, I'm not going to go through each one of these. Um, you can find more information about these requirements in Appendix 2 of the Uniform Guidance, and that would be at 2 CFR Part 200. Um, before you enter into any contract on your grant, you know, if you don't have the text for for these 11 provisions, just contact your program officer for help or even uh, check the award notice you signed and the application you submitted. Um, somewhere along the way, whether you know it or not, you signed off on most of these provisions already when you received the grant. So you might have, you know, in your award documents, all the text for all of these that you could just cut and paste and put into your contracts. But if you don't, contact your program officer and they will be glad to help you. Okay. That is federal grant procurement standards in a nutshell. Um, that's it. That's all I've got. I, I can give you no more at least not in this presentation. Maybe if you call me on the phone or if you email me, I'll come up with something clever. But for right now, this is it. Safe and E. Uh, thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, just email me through my website or reach out on social media. I'm here to help. If you found this useful, like it or give it a thumbs up. Feel free to, le uh, feel free to leave a comment. I, I love feedback. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any future presentations. Thanks. See you next time.